بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتحة لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق الهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلى ما جعله سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم وتجعل الحزن إذا شد سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Again, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, again, I apologize for the late start. For those who are on Instagram Live, I am on the Rahma Foundations Zoom uh, um, session for the Foundations of the Spiritual Path, which is a class we've been doing since the beginning of Ramadan. And inshallah, we're still uh, in it. There are recordings for previous sessions, but alhamdulillah, I'm also able to broadcast on Instagram. So. If you want to see the actual class, just join the uh, Foundations of the Spiritual Path. You can go to the Rahma Foundation and uh, find the link there. Um, so for those who are in the class uh, and have been here, let me go ahead and screen share, inshallah, so that we can go ahead and jump into today's session. So um, alhamdulillah, we're almost done with this document. Um, as I've said every, every week now, it's an incredible document. It really does help to... Um, give you some groundwork or some, it lays the foundation for you, literally, it's called the foundations on how to be on the spiritual path and, and to avoid the common pitfalls that many of us will likely experience if we don't have guidance, right? Because trying to practice the faith first and foremost without teachers, without guides um, is quite dangerous. And this is why you see many people today uh, be uh, you know misguided because they're they're it's very confusing. There's too much information. There's too much um, you know uh, false misinformation and trying to uh, navigate all of that without help is is very difficult. So then the nefs just doesn't want to put in that work, and a lot of times people just give up. It becomes too hard, uh, and that's why it's so important that we um, have the jama and that we stick to a grounded qualified teachers, because they will help us. Just as you would imagine, if you were to embark on anything new for the first time, it's very overwhelming when you do it on your own. But if you had somebody holding your hand, you know, through it, um, through any, you know, new subject or, or, or endeavor, um, a, you know, if you were to travel somewhere, you were to take on a new practice, you would benefit greatly from someone who's already been there and done that and had the experience. So likewise, with our deen, alhamdulillah, we are highly encouraged to seek out qualified teachers. And so this document, what it does is it helps us to really organize ourselves, to have structure, to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, and who we should gain our knowledge from, and then as well to avoid uh, you know, the dangers. And so last week, um, we talked about the qualifications uh, Oh, I'm sorry, hold on. I think I apologize. I, I'm trying to recall if we even got to that one yet. I think so. So let me actually go. It's easier for me to switch to this uh, presentation um, of slides that I put together, if you recall, uh, to see if, yes. So we talked about the qualities of a false teacher last week. Um, and so in the document, if you go to page um, 11, there are, there, he goes in this interesting order. I pointed this out last week too. So page 11 and 12, where he talks about those who make claims about having like, you know, certain spiritual qualifications um, and how to know if they're really lying or delusional. And then he goes into the qualifications of what would, you know, be appropriate for a spiritual guide. And then he goes to how to distinguish from someone who you should absolutely stay away from. And so uh, we got to the end of that list last week. So you can, the recordings are all available, by the way, through the Rahma Foundation, if you want to go back and hear that commentary. 
But um, here is the, sorry, I thought I had it in slideshow, but maybe not. Uh, let me exit full screen, there we go. So here is the um, visual slides that I prepared uh, that went over the qualities of the false teacher and then the claims that such teachers make, right? Either they're false or they're deluded because some people, they mean well, they have good intentions, maybe their heart is in the right place, but their own ego, their own delusion is um, is causing them, you know, to, to misrepresent themselves or maybe aspects of the dean. And so um, you need to know how to distinguish between the two. You know, there's false teachers who have, they're just, you know, they have uh, ulterior motives. They're not qualified at all. Not They don't have good intentions. Um, and they are charlatans. That's, the, that's why they're false. And they, you know, would definitely be ones that we should stay clear from. But those who are delusional, you know, they could just be, again, misguided themselves, and then they are contributing to the misguidance. So there are, there's a difference there, but in both cases, you should know how to distinguish between the two. So Sidi Ahmed Zaruq, he mentions here that, you know, ignorance of the religion, if you're going to take some something from anyone or who claims to be an expert, but they don't even know what they're talking about, then clearly that disqualifies them immediately. So if they're ignorant of the dean, they don't really know things that you ask them questions and they're just not sure, or they don't seem to really have solid understanding, then that's a red flag. If they have disregard uh, or irre you know irreverence for other Muslims, this is also a problem because a believer and someone who really has studied uh, the, the Quranic worldview, the prophetic uh, worldview, will understand um, that adab is at the heart of our tradition. And so if you start to disparage, disparagingly speak about other people, this is obviously a big problem, So especially other Muslims. And then engaging in matters of no concern. So if this person who claims to be, again, a teacher is not minding their own business, um, and meddlesome, you know, some people are quite meddlesome and quarrelsome. They like argumentation. They like to know other people's business. They're, you know, curious about other things that really don't have anything to do with them. It displays definitely uh, a weakness in character because these are very basic foundational principles in Islam that you, as part of trying to maintain boundaries and adab, that you do not delve into matters that are of no concern to you. And that's why it's a hadith, right? The Prophet literally said that part of the beauty of one's Islam is to mind your own business. So that is something that a teacher should certainly do, right? And, and also practice. Um, engaging in matters, I'm sorry, following his caprice. So this is also a, a dangerous sign, right? A red flag that if a person claims to be a teacher, but then they seem to be just dict their their desires are dictating to them as opposed to actual rational thoughts or proofs evidence from the dean but they kind of um, speak uh, about uh, things as though they're just a lot of opinions personal opinions being infused into what they're saying they don't cite you know so citation is really important for a teacher um, of really any subject they should have sources, they should be able to direct you to solid sources. So if a teacher is teaching you things and they don't have sources or they're not speaking um, from the perspective of other teachers, right? Like right now, what we're doing is we are sharing the the the, the um, ideas and the the teachings of our scholar, you know, Sayyid Ahmed Zarruq, translated by Sheikh Hamza um, Yusuf. And so we are relying on senior, more qualified teachers, their uh, perspective, their commentary. And all we're doing is we're talking about it. This is a discussion, if anything. But if I came on here and I just started making a bunch of claims and and uh, giving fatwa left and right, and I don't think people should do this, and I don't think people should do that, and this is wrong, but I'm not an, ever um, citing sources. I'm not referring to teachers who know better. I'm not maybe paraphrasing or, or somehow at least um, mentioning that what I'm sharing is from the tradition, then it's fair to presume I'm speaking from my, myself. I'm speaking from my own opinion. And that's something that we should be very wary of in this day and age, because a lot of people have opinions. Um, I think it's definitely a concern just how 
um, how often people are willing to share their opinions, even on matters that we don't have the prerequisite qualifications to have an opinion on, right? Which just speaks to the day and age we live in. Um, you know, social media, I think, has definitely complicated this spiritual test because it is a spiritual test. If you speak on things that you're not qualified to speak on and you misrepresent your knowledge, that's a spiritual test because you, you know, you, you we have to be very afraid of that. Uh, our tongues, actually, the Prophet has warned uh, in a hadith that, you know, the two things that will land most people in the hellfire are what emanate from their tongue and their private parts. And so, and these, this amongst many other hadith that have a similar message warns us about being too loose lipped, you know, talking too freely, um, sharing our opinions just about on everything. We should be very cautious because wisdom should dictate or wisdom should, you know, inform us that sometimes what you're saying could very well be sound and it could be, um, you know, huck, but is the timing the right timing, right? And if you're too, uh, as I said, loose-lipped, um, then you might not have wisdom to know that in a certain setting, maybe it's better not to say something, right? Maybe it's better to refrain from saying something, even if it's huck and there's, there's no dispute about it, because the timing or the environment, or there's maybe people in attendance who could um, who could misconstrue what you're saying. So it's very, very dangerous to not have, again, that element of, of um, restraint, you know, to be able to not feel like you compelled to constantly share everything. Um, it's, it's, it's very important to have that and to be mindful that even if you have more knowledge in a gathering than other people, that you have to assess the situation, read the room, as they say, make sure that, you know, if, if someone is, a, for example, a senior scholar or, or, or more learned than you, they, they know more than you, and they're in the same room, and a topic comes up, but you find that they are not as talkative, or, or they're kind of, you know, maybe not participating on that particular topic, if you feel like you want to say something, um, that should be something that you should really think about. Like why, if, if someone has more knowledge than me and is more qualified than me, is choosing to remain silent in this gathering, um, then maybe I should take my cues from them. And this is why it's so important to have access to, to, to people who are, who are learned because you'll learn a lot of things without direct instruction, just observing. Just observing teachers and the way that they are with each other, the way that they behave, what they say, how much they say, what they don't say, will teach you a lot about, you know, how to maintain a certain level of, again, um, restraint in public settings. And later, you know, and I've been in many of these situations and, you know, as I said, in the moment, you're feeling like compelled, but then in hindsight or later on, you realize, oh, that's why this particular topic wasn't discussed or this teacher didn't say anything, even though it, it, the, everything seemed like, um, you know, like the timing was right, but maybe they, they chose not to. There was, there's always a wisdom. There's always something that, that they know that perhaps um, not everyone is privy to, but this is, these are very subtle things. And so, you know, being a person who's aware of themselves to that degree, you're not going to be um, shifty. You know, you, you won't see teachers who are very grounded and really practicing all of these things that help them accountable behave in a way that, as I said, would be shifty, you know, like they, and which is what he's describing. Someone who's following his desires seems to, you know, waffle a lot, seems to um, be, be led by something other than wisdom that, that's very a, a stabilizing force, right? Wisdom is something that is stabilizing. Whereas people who are led by their desires, they're inconsistent. They're not, they don't seem reliable. There's something off. So that's, that's definitely something to be concerned about. And then the last thing that he mentions about teachers who are false and qualities that we should know about is that they're they, they're un, they have unashamed displays of bad manners 
followed by a lack of remorse, right? So they don't make, um, they don't ha seem to feel bad when they act out uh, of line or they say something or do something that is unbecoming or unfitting for someone who claims to be a teacher. This could be using, um, you know, being like rude, maybe uh, someone loses their cool and temper, you know, and this can certainly happen. Um, people of of all different faith practices can can lose comportment. They can lose their um, you know their temper quickly and maybe lash out at someone. Maybe say something harsh. Everybody and anybody is capable of that. But it's the way that you hold yourself to account when you do something like that and you kind of wake up from what you've done that says a lot about your character, right? Because we should not expect. Uh, people uh, to be perfect all the time, but we can certainly expect that when they come back into a rational state, a state of taqwa, a state of awareness of themselves, that they would have no reluctance at all to hold themselves accountable, to apologize, to try to make amends, to fix the situation, to seek you know, some sort of um, redemption for themselves and for anybody that they may have impacted to try to remove that harm. So if they're just going to behave poorly, be rude, um, slight people, be dismissive, um, use foul language, as I said, lose their temper, but then you don't even see any acknowledgement of it after the fact um, or any redress, you know, then that's clearly a, a, a red flag. Um, so that those are the qualities he mentions of a false teachers and a false teacher. And then he goes into previously right because it's the the order is interesting but anyway he he says um he also outlines the claims and actions of people who are false and deluded um and those are similar in a way but he says that uh, allowing any member or student to fall into sinful disobedience so this is definitely a red flag i mean if you're claiming to be a teacher but then the students around you are clearly doing haram they may have um let's just say unethical business practices or they're um Tyrant, tyrannical, you know, in their homes, they're known to be doing things that are really uh, scandalous, and you're just like, oh, that's fine. No, that's inconsistent, because um, it's very important for teachers to maintain order within their, within, you know, with their students and to hold them accountable. That's kind of the purpose, right, of the teacher-student relationship, is that the teacher is mindful of whatever character defects or problems that their students are displaying, and they would be the first to correct them. It's like a parent-child relationship in a way, right? There's a spiritual parenting that happens with a teacher and a student. So clearly it would be, uh, be, be a, an issue if a teacher were to knowingly allow their students to do things that were outright sins and disobedience, acts of disobedience. So that's one red flag. There's something off about anybody who claims to be a teacher and they allow that. Um, affectations in his devotional practice, so over, overly performant, performative, um, just seemingly off. It doesn't seem genuine. It seems like it's all an act. Definitely look out for that. Expectations from the creation. So anybody who claims to um, be strong in their faith, but then relies more on uh, people than they do on Allah and and has seems to have a dependence on on people uh, or or others and not as much so with Allah even in the way that they speak um, or the way that they behave would certainly be a red flag backbiting against the people of Allah that's a pretty obvious one um, someone who's a teacher should never be engaged in things that are you know unequivocally haram backbiting is well amongst those things it's clearly um, there's no you know, way of, of really uh, justifying that. And backbiting, um, you know, there's, there's when, I mean, we have to qualify these things because sometimes people misinterpret it, but like, you know, if you're speaking, warning people of, of others that are harmful um, um, or if people are asking you direct questions, let's say for the purpose of marriage and you have to disclose certain information, that's actually, correct right because there are certain conditions marriage business there's certain things that may come up for people and they need uh, to vet others and so they may turn to someone even in a leadership position or a teaching position and ask them you know what do you think of so-and-so and so-and-so in that capacity we have to be we have to tell the truth 
especially if people are asking us. And that's not the same as backbiting because backbiting is just a very low thing. It's it's speaking ill of people, you know, behind their back. Um, whether it's true or not, it's, it doesn't matter. You're using, you know, you're speaking about their private life. You're referring to them in a way that would hurt them. Even subhanAllah, I mean, the the definition of backbiting can extend beyond just the person themselves. Like it even extends to their possessions, right? So if you if you said something rude about a person's car, about a person's clothing, right? It's not their actual personhood, but it's part of them because it, you know, it's a, a, by extension, right? It's something they own. Um, this would be considered backbiting, right? And so we have to be even describing someone in a way that is that you know may hurt their feelings, we have to be very careful. Um, like if you know, if you're trying to describe a person's physical appearance and you're using words that are, you know that if they heard you say them, it would likely hurt their feelings, this would be, um, this would be a, a form of backbiting. We have to be so careful and so delicate when we're describing people. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot to say about that, but the point is, is people who are um, in a, in a capacity of guiding others should know these things and they should certainly not ever openly backbite or openly say things harm, harmful about people. And then the last one is uh, lacking the proper respect in accordance with the commands of Allah. So this is, again, just goes down to basic adab. All of these things are signs for us to look out for so that we are not deluded or um, tricked, you know, by, um, by these types of teachers. Um, okay, so alhamdulillah, now back to the document. So that was kind of just a quick summary of what we talked about last week, but now he shifts gears again and he uh, says, you know, the, the, the last list that he has here is the spiritual courtesies of a student with his or her spiritual guide as well as the fellow wayfarers on the path, right? So with your fellow students on the on the path, there is an expectation, right? That we maintain a certain level of adab um, with the way that we deal with our teachers as well as other students. So this is now bringing it all kind of full circle, right? Because we started off laying the foundations of what you need to be on a spiritual path in terms of objectives and goals, right? Um, and, you know, we can quickly repeat those for those who, again, who are on Instagram, maybe, and joining us for the first time. But those very first um, five foundations are very important to know, because everything that we've just studied, and over the course of all of these weeks, actually go back to these five, which are having taqwa, um, and that, you know, and, and that is consistent, right? Having taqwa, of Allah, and then practicing the Sunnah, which is you know again there's a, there's a theme that when you uh, when you study the the five, um, you'll see this theme of consistency. So he mentions first turning to Allah Subhanahu in prosperity and adversity, which is taqwa, and then um, I'm sorry, excuse me, mindfulness of Allah privately and publicly, which is taqwa, and then uh, adherence to the Sunnah in word and deed which is, you know, again, consistency in terms of practicing the, knowing the sunnah, you know, knowing it, reading it, studying it, um, but also acting in line with it. Uh, so that's the second objective of someone who should be, on, who's on the spiritual path, that they want to always be mindful of Allah privately and publicly. They want to be practicing the sunnah and word indeed. And then they also are free from the bondage of, you know, wanting to be accepted by people or or free from the fear of being rejected by people which is again if you think about how many decisions people make every single day of their life that has to do with these two things right a fear of being rejected or a desire to be accepted a lot of people are um are uh, compelled to action for those two reasons right you're either trying to be in the in group, or you're afraid of being kicked out to the out group. And now with cancel culture, for example, you see this on such a wide scale because there are many people who don't want to 
share openly their beliefs. They don't want to speak about certain values they have or you know principles they they live by because they're too afraid to to be canceled to be um judged themselves and so that you know puts us in a in a very uh compromised position right because when you look at our faith our faith teaches us that as believers anyway we have to be doing amr bil ma'ruf wa nahyan al munkar so if you are you know reading that quranic message um, that your part of your task as a Muslim is to be the one who is establishing the good and and enjoining the good and forbidding the the bad. Then how do you reconcile that with this fear that you have of not being accepted um, and wanting so much to be? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the fear of uh, being rejected and wanting to be accepted. How do you reconcile that with Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nahyan al Munkar? Um, and it's a very delicate balance. And this is where, again, you know, wisdom comes into place because you, there is there are ways to do these things delicately. Sometimes you you can do them overtly, and other times you have to be more subtle. Um, and but it's a it's something that it's easier to learn if you're actually with people who who have that life experience. Um, if you let your own emotions and your own reactivity, like we're very, and this is why it's so important to learn about your temperament, because if you don't know your own temperament, then you may um, get yourself in a lot of trouble, right? Uh, some people are very temperamentally reactive emotionally. They're not really using sound judgment. They're just in a heightened emotional state and then they act. Um, but as you practice your Dean more and more and you learn these things, then you learn the importance of really maintaining um, that prophetic ability to just be in a state of equilibrium where you're not easily pushed this way or that way. So this concept of indifference is, is a very broad uh, topic, but it's really about being so firmly rooted in your dean and knowing very well like the um, that there's that not everything has to be rushed. You know, I feel like in this day and age, that's something that's lost on a lot of us because we're used to um, instant satisfaction or instant gratification. We're used to things being done so quickly and haphazardly that we forget that there is an alternate, you know, path, which is take your time with things. You don't have to react to every single, for example, scandal that comes about. Like how many people, I mean, how many times have we seen this in our own community? Um, especially online, right? There's some scandal that happens. And within seconds, it's like a firestorm because people are posting about it and sharing. And now it's all these reactions and it just becomes this huge, you know, gossip fest where, you know, things are, uh, people are rushed, you know, snap judgments, you rush to judgment, you start to speak ill of, of people without all the facts even coming out yet. Um, and that's why, you know, if you're again around teachers who practice all of these things, you will not find them amongst those who are, you know, right at the onset of, of something that they're, they're, you know, they're, um, it's, you know, they're, they're broadcasting things right away. They, they'll actually reserve judgment until um, either more facts come about or they feel themselves that they have given, you know, the, the situation enough time to assess all sides. So patience, right? These are all hallmark qualities of the believer um, are, is, is something that you just naturally learn when you, when you forego the pressure of having to, again, appeal to anyone because you're more concerned about your state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a very important quality, the indifference to the, uh, to or acceptance, uh, sorry, the indifference to the acceptance or rejection of others. And then the fourth quality he mentions is the satisfaction with Allah and hardship and ease. Again, consistency. So whether you're going through hardships or ease, you're still, you have radha with Allah. You don't complain. You're just like, alhamdulillah, um, Allah knows best. If he put me in this situation, even though it's not what I want, he knows best. And I just have to see it through. Um, and you hold your tongue and you try not to say things that you know would um, reveal some conflict that you have internally, right? And the thing is, we can't control our thoughts, but we can certainly uh, control our words. Uh, and this is why, you know, it's a beautiful 
uh, practice, but um, it's actually, um, I can't remember it in Arabic, but you know, when, for example, someone you love passes away, uh, one of the beautiful responses um, is that, you know, your heart is saddened, but you um, fear God and you, you do not wish to say anything that would displease him. Um, and so that is the state of the believer is that you really are mindful to not have bad adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though internally there is pain um, and sorrow and grief, you would rather remain in a state of complete satisfaction with God's decree um, su to such an extent that you hold your tongue and you uh, are very choice with, with your words and how you grieve, you know, and it's, it takes a lot of discipline to do that because, I mean, I think anybody who's ever lost someone, especially if it's an unexpected death, I think they would be lying uh, if, they, if they said that they didn't feel like it was uh, unfair or that they wished it could be undone. Most people, when you lose a loved one, regardless of the circumstance, it's so difficult to bear that you, um, you know, you you are really practicing restraint. You, you're trying so hard not to say something wrong, but that comes from taqwa. That comes from all of these beautiful qualities of trying to maintain the best adab with Allah. And then the last quality is the turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity, so that you have the the right understanding of what to do in these circumstances in both um, when things are going well and Allah's generosity is shown on you because, you know, maybe opportunities are coming to you, wealth, health, a lot of things that we take for granted that you recognize that these are all gifts from Allah and you, you can't help but to maintain a state of constant gratitude to him, right? So that's the turning to Allah. And then in adversity as well, when things are very difficult for you, um, you know the same, that nobody can bring you relief other than Allah. So you turn to him. But knowing that that's the protocol, regardless of my situation, again, consistency, I know what to do. So he lays these five foundations, right? These are the actual foundations that the document starts off with. And then, as we said, he goes into... Oh, sorry, actually, it's wrong screen here. He goes into the adab that a student should have. So now it's back to holding ourselves accountable to whether or not if we are on a spiritual path, if we have a teacher, or maybe we're in a jama'a, we're part of a group, we're learning with other people, whatever the circumstances is, these are the things that we should be mindful of. So he says, first, following the directions of the guide even if it is contrary to one's own preference. Now, you know, we can obviously, um, depending on the circumstance, right, we can, we can certainly um, take that with a grain of salt, I guess they say, which is, you know, if, you're, if your guide is, is uh, connected to you and they're giving you counsel, especially when it comes to your spiritual practice, um, you know, that's definitely something that you should defer to them, because if they're telling you, you know, focus on this area of study first, uh, don't go out of order and then do this and then this, then if you're entrusting your yourself with their with them, then you should just follow their advice. But if it's matters that they don't really um, have any area of expertise in or, you know, sometimes people get you know, it's, it's when you're put in this position of being like an advisor to someone else, um, if you aren't mindful, you can just start to, you know, do that on, on many, on a range of matters, you know, it's like you're giving now dispensing relationship advice, financial advice. So it's not even just, you know, religious like counsel, but it's like, oh, let me just tell you about everything that you should be doing, because this is how, what I think some people may have that, may have that um issue because they maybe are are leaders they have natural leadership qualities and sometimes if you have that you just feel like you're you're responsible for people so you feel the need to uh, to tell them what to do on every 
area of their life. Um, so if you find that the, the one that you're entrusting your spiritual guidance to is also giving you now other advice, but you're not quite sure about whether or not their judgment is sound on certain things. And I would certainly use your own judgment. This is why we have to have some, you know, degree of wisdom and even what we, um, or, or the, uh, the amount of, of, um, dependency that we have on certain people in our lives, right? Um, we're all, I mean, when you reach the age of, of adulthood and you're an independent person um, and you've, for the most part, lived your life um, independently, uh, you know, uh, or you, you're, you're in that stage, then you should be able to make um, your own choices. And of course, we have istikhara and we have, we can uh, seek counsel from many people when it comes to different areas of our life. Uh, so we don't have to give, uh, you know, complete auto our autonomy um, or our um, ability to, you know, to, to make decisions over. We don't have to hand that over to someone else. This is not what having a spiritual guide is about. And unfortunately, there are people who have done that. You know, there are many people who whose relationship with their quote unquote teacher or guide turned into something that was very different. It, it was codependency, an unhealthy, um, enmeshed sort of situation where now this teacher is completely overbearingly involved in that person's life. And I've heard really sad stories about marriages being affected, uh, divorces being enacted, you know, because, oh, the teacher said so-and-so. I would be very cautious of anybody who is telling you what to do like directly because I've been around many great teachers who they give nasiha in a very uh, subtle way. If you ask questions, you know, they will give you, present to you answers. Um, but I have rarely met teachers who are willingly uh, telling people how to live their life. They don't dictate, you know, they'll just say, you know, well, this is an opinion. It's, it's very uh, general the way that they uh, approach these things. Whereas someone who's on a bit of a power trip, you know, as they say, may feel that they have the right to tell you what to do about everything in your life. And that's beyond giving nasiha. That's, you know, that's, you know, telling someone how to live. Um, and that's, that's definitely concerning, I would say, especially if it's not with religious counsel, but it's just like financially, as I said, or in your relationship, but they're meddling in your personal life um, or getting involved with the decisions that you need to make on in a very direct way without being solicited, right? Because it's oftentimes it's unsolicited advice. So nobody even asked, but then, you know, this, these people will want to tell you um, or warn you for whatever reason. And sometimes there's other things going on. So anyway, red flag. Um, but generally speaking, when it comes to religious practice, yes, follow their guidance. And especially if you think like logically, oh, wouldn't it make more sense for me to do this subject first? Or shouldn't I focus on this first? Don't rely on your own logic and assessments when it comes to these things. And I feel like um, a lot of this comes from like the Western tradition, because, you know, in Western academia, there is this notion of students kind of seeing themselves almost on equal footing with their teachers. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that they're the teacher or the professor and they have the credentials, but we can challenge them. It's, you know, it's, it becomes this um, exercise of will. And, you know, it's like a, it's very competitive in the way that students are seen, uh, are taught to see their teachers. Whereas Islamically, the, deference to the teacher um, is, is demanded, right? That we show our, our teacher's deference. And that means that we acknowledge that they may have insights, spiritual insights that we just simply don't know. And that as he says here, even if it's contrary to one's preference, that we think about it from the perspective of, oh, well, I might think this makes sense, but they know maybe from experience, maybe they've had other students go through similar things and they have 
an insight on the matter that I don't have. So it's just really showing that level of humility to know, to stay in your own lane, I guess you could say. So that's the first adab that a student would have with their guide. And then he says, avoiding what the guide forbids, even if it would appear to be highly adverse to the student. So in the first case, it's following their directions. In the second case, it's you know avoiding what they have forbidden. And it's the same idea, right? Which is there may be considerations that they have that you simply aren't you know, attuned to. And if you're entrusting them um, and they have experience and they know you and you've, you feel that you maybe even know others who are their students and you feel really confident that they know what they're doing, that you, uh, you basically allow, you know, that, or show, display that humility where you uh, defer to them. So that's the second point of Adam. And then maintaining utmost reverence for them in their presence and absence during their lives and after their deaths. So if you have a teacher, um, as we just mentioned, deference, respect is so important. So when you are in their company and we don't have to go over the top, you know, some, some groups take it to a level where it's uncomfortable, you know, and we have to be very, again, cautious um, and just really look at the best examples in our tradition are the Sahaba and how they were with the Prophet ﷺ, because he is all of our teacher, right? He is the greatest teacher. So if we want to see how the students around the teacher are, then we look to the students and see how did they speak to the Prophet ﷺ? How did they address him? How did they welcome him? How did they serve him? Um, and they're beautiful hadith, you know. Um, I think it was Sayyidina Abu Bakr, uh, for example, I think it was him. He said that, you know, when they were in, in a majlis or a dars with the Prophet ﷺ, that they would be sitting as though birds were perched on their head, um, which is, you know, a level of stillness, a level of, of mindfulness and respect that I'm sure we can all visualize just by those words, right? To sit still. Um, because birds are pretty sensitive, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever handled a bird before or played with a bird or had one on your finger, maybe a parakeet. Um, you know, to have birds perched on your head, I think is a pretty, um, it's obvious what he's saying, that there was a stillness in their presence, the way that they were sitting. So, for example, like when we had lessons many, many years ago with Sheikh Muhammad Ali Aqubi, one of the great Syrian uh, uh, contemporary scholars, mashallah, um, he was very big on this, on the way that students sat in the majlis. You know, he, he, he really expected the students to not move very much, um, to not ever stretch your legs out, uh, because this would be considered bad adab, right? If you're, if you're sitting in, a, in many of these classes, you know, in, in a masjid setting are usually on the ground, right? So the students are sitting on the ground. Um, and so if you're sitting in a traditional classical uh, setting, it would be considered a breach of adab for students to um, extend their feet toward the teacher to keep moving a lot, being distracting. And now, I mean, how many of us see it even during the Juma Khutbah where you cannot get through a 20, 30 minute talk without cell phones going off. Some people will, are brazen enough to take a phone call in the middle of a khutbah, uh, subhanAllah, or people are on their phone browsing. So this is completely unacceptable because it shows such a lack of respect to the teachers or to the scholars or to whoever is in that position when we are so easily distractible and then we let our bodies and our physical presence become, um, they, they, they're almost re revealing their agit uh, the agitation, right? Because if you're moving around a lot, maybe uh, if you have a health issue, that's totally different. But if it's just like you're yawning, you're um, making noises or stretching or chewing gum or eating or doing things that are like you've you have no consideration for the setting. I mean, this is a heavy, weighty thing, right? To come together in a circle of dhikr or knowledge 
and to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to study a sacred text or to you know, read from the Quran or hadith, you want to really think about what is your body doing? What are you communicating? What are you, how are you holding yourself? Um, even in our prayers, I mean, the whole reason why we have to be so mindful of the prayer, even the movements of the prayer is because it's, an, it's a very momentous event, right? To come before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to be well uh, presentable, right? You're dressed well. We first of all make our wudu because we should be in a state of pure purity, but then we also should be dressed well and we should be very mindful of our movements in the prayer because um, actually in the Hanafi fiqh, I, I, I believe it's three, three or more. If you start to excessively move around, um, and and do things your prayer is in, uh, invalid because you've you've broken that protocol of just behave you know it's not a very long process and we all do it may Allah forgive us um you know sometimes we're so distracted and thinking about other things we may not be aware of just how much we are moving excessively you know so if you're constantly touching your clothes or pulling on this and that or your nose and you're just moving around a lot you know or some people are um, playing with jewelry imagine you know you're, you're supposed to be uh, focused on Allah and praising him and really in this state of um, you know where, where you're humbling yourself before him um, appealing to him praising him asking him seeking his forgiveness but then you're um, you know cracking knuckles uh, playing with your jewelry, um, touching your you know hands and kind of doing little movements. These are this is not acceptable, and we have to be very careful. So then, in in a setting again with teachers and students, where you're supposed to come together and you know have the good of Allah, it's the same concept, right? That you are what it's a momentous event. It's something very weighty and heavy. So you should show that in your decorum, in your the way that you hold your body, the way that you hold yourself. You shouldn't be getting up every without, um, you know. And I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, so I see this happen all the time in classroom settings, where students will just get up and they'll go throw something away. I've had this several times. This is totally unacceptable. You have to seek permission if there is a reason, you know, that you need to move. Uh, maybe you have to leave. Um, sorry, you know, if, the, if there was a reason that you had to leave, that you would do it, but you would do it with that respect, right? I apologize. I have to just quickly um, charge the iPad here that I have. One second, everybody, forgive me, but we have my charger here. Okay, so um, let's see here. Okay, this is going to get tricky because I can't put it on the charger. How am I going to do this? All right, you guys, I'm clearly not ready for all this tech technology here. <laughs> okay, inshallah, you guys can still see me. I know it's a little slanted, but it's going to have to do. All right, so bismillah. So he was, um, sorry, we were on the point about maintaining utmost reverence for our teachers in their presence and in their absence. So this is also another really important point that if someone says something about your teacher um, in their absence that you show respect and you defend their honor. Um, let's say that it was a negative remark or just something that you know wasn't maybe said in the best context or mis maybe there's a misrepresentation that you if 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 you know you know you know the the accurate um, uh, you know position that they hold or you you can somehow defend them. You should you should defend them um, and then. The other part of it is in their lifetime and after, if they, if Allah takes them early or, or from, you know, uh, while you're alive, then you should always speak well of them and veil them. Because sometimes, you know, as I said earlier, teachers are human, so they may, you know, have, have lost, um, you know, comportment at some point or said something or did something that maybe wasn't, you know, very, um, you know, it's something that, that you should veil. You should veil them. You shouldn't speak ill of them. You shouldn't unveil them and tell people their business or their private. Maybe you you saw things about their private life. Um, 
that others who don't know those details would never know. So certainly you should never share those things just because you had access to them. That's one of the um, the great, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, right? That sometimes when, um, you know, people open up their homes or uh, they, they start to be a little bit more relaxed around people that one of the risks is that, you know, that becomes information that's supposed to be private but it becomes shared openly with other people. Oh yeah, I saw their home, their home situation. Oh, oh, I saw the way he he or she talks to their siblings, or I mean their spouses or their children. And you just start to unveil people. This is not right because um, the teacher is clearly inviting you to their private space to teach you, to give you their time. Um, and so veil them. If you see something that you, even if it's questionable or unpleasant, then you should have that taqwa to just none of my business. I'm not saying anything, but you know that that deference and reverence is really important to have. And then giving them their due according to one's ability without stint. So if you know they, um, I mean, this could be you know interpreted in different ways, but you know to compensate them for uh, their time with you, if if you're able to, you know, some teachers are very humble and they will not ever ask. But if you um, if they're giving you their time, they're sharing their knowledge with you, they are making accommodations for you that other people uh, they 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 don't make. Then you should have it within your own conscience to to know that they deserve to be compensated and to not expect people to do things for you, as they say, free sabidala. You know, if someone is going to teach you something. Um, just because they're a teacher and that's what they do doesn't mean that you think it's a free ride. And the, unfortunately, that still exists uh, in our community where some people just expect like the imam or the teacher who's at the masjid um, because they're there anyway, that they always do things free without any monetary um, you know, compensation or that they expect these discounts and these exceptions and, oh, can you please you know, do this favor for me and this, and we just start to get really um, entitled and, and have too many expectations of our teachers and our, and our religious, you know, and our scholars. So if you're able to afford something, you give them their due, you're not stingy, you don't expect them to do things freely for you, and the least you can gift them, because there are some teachers who will not take money, and they make it very clear that they don't want to have a salary of any type, or um, like an expected salary, but you could always gift. And that's something that you should consider. You know, if, if you meet someone who's like, no, 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 it's okay. I want to do this for the sake of Allah. Some people, mashallah, are very generous and they really genuinely mean it because they may also be in a position where they just want to do good and give back to the community. So they feel like, okay, I have time. I can teach this person. But if they don't want to accept a monetary um, consistent sort of payment or fee from you, then you could at least, um, out of the goodness of your heart, gift them, uh, especially if you like conclude a class or you conclude an area of study with them, just give them a nice gift. And it could be for all of the time that they spent with you, but you're at least acknowledging and showing your gratitude. And of course, dua and all of those things are um, certainly uh, included, but to give them a nice gift would be beautiful. And then relinquishing one's own understanding, knowledge, and leadership to that of the teacher, unless uh, these are already in accordance with one's teacher. So really just not having this smug attitude that, you know, that one is at the same level as a teacher, right? Because um, sometimes this is, you know, again, it comes from, I think, um, the Western tradition, but we can get ahead of ourselves and just start to see ourselves on equal footing with teachers. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of Muslims who haven't even put in one one hundredth of the amount of time and energy and study um, as a teacher, but then they will have these hot takes on a teacher's position. And it's like, oh, I don't agree with them because you know, they didn't think about this or that. And they just start to act as though that they're on the same footing. But it's like, wait a second, where did you study? How long have you studied? Oh, you're just a student of knowledge. Why do you have an opinion on this matter in the first place? 
Um, and, and the student of Adab always is very cognizant of their limitations. So they never even go there. And if they hear an interpretation um, that they don't agree with, they'll always presume that they have a weak understanding, that they don't have the full picture. They won't rush to judgment and, um, and doubt the teacher and, and assume that they just are wrong. Um, but they'll say, oh, maybe I am not clear on this, or I have the wrong understanding of this, or there's, you know, I'm limited because of, I don't have the language or the uh, knowledge in this particular area. So all of these qualities are really important when you are a student of knowledge. And it's really about maintaining humility, right? And I mean, if you can see all five of them, what it really comes down to is once you are on a spiritual path and you see yourself in that capacity, that you hold your tongue and you check your nafs and you are very clear about who you are um, and that you uh, need guidance, right, from your teacher and you're, you're in a way beholden to them, um, not as, you know, not, not necessarily because of who they are, but the place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put them above you, right? That you feel this indebtedness to them. Like Allah, you have placed me with this teacher, which is such a gift because to even have access to a teacher is such a gift. And um, I feel a great indebtedness to, uh, to, to them for their service to me. So out of that comes this desire to serve, to um, obey, to... Uh, take their warnings and advice seriously, to not question every single thing. But as I said in the beginning, the caveat is that the teacher is displaying all of those beautiful qualities that we talked about. If they're not displaying those qualities, those prophetic qualities, then these things would not apply. This would apply if the teacher is a qualified, sound teacher who knows what they're talking about and also doesn't delve into areas that they're not qualified to, to, to talk about. So that's the caveat, right? That if they are really true teachers and they understand and they're on the path of tradition and, um, and you trust that because alhamdulillah, their you know, reputation precedes them. They have prophetic like qualities. Uh, you haven't seen anything that would cause you concern. Then yes, you should maintain this level of respect for the teacher. So then he ends this era section and says, should the seeker not find a guiding teacher or find one who is lacking in any of these five conditions, he should depend on him only in those conditions the teacher fulfills. As for areas he is wanting in, he should treat him like a brother regarding them. And so that's kind of in a gist what I was saying. So you take from what the teacher excels in and in other cases, you just see them as another human being who's got opinions maybe, but not necessarily ones that you have to follow. Uh, worldly matters, if they, you know, they have, they can have their opinions, but you're not uh, obliged to obey them in those matters. Whereas when it comes to spiritual uh, matters, inshallah, it's best to defer to them because that's why they're in that capacity, right? Um, so then, alhamdulillah, he says, thus ends the five foundations with the praise, help, and the perfect success of Allah. So alhamdulillah, this is the, the conclusion of this incredible document. And then he goes, it is necessary to read this every day, once or twice. I mean, just imagine reading this document every single day, right? But subhanAllah, why is he saying it? And if it's not possible, then at least once a week until what? Its meanings are imprinted. So it's not that you have to do it for life, but that you get it, that you grasp what he is telling you, right? That it's imprinted on one's soul and manifest in one's behavior. Indeed, it contains that which enables one to dispense with many books and much advice. And it is said, surely they have been denied a rival by their neglect of the foundations. Whoever reflects deeply on what we have said will acknowledge its truth and he will continue to have recourse to it, using it as a reminder for him. Success is ultimately by Allah. So alhamdulillah, um, this is the end of this particular section of the foundations of the spiritual path. 
for those of you who've been a part of the class, it's not that it's necessarily over because he also includes the Council of Imam al nawawi as well as more counsel from Sidi Ahmed Zarouk, which we will get to next week, which will likely be our last official class, inshallah. Um, and then maybe we might extend it to include a QA and a uh, in case there are any um, outstanding questions or things that haven't been covered. But alhamdulillah, I know this is a very content heavy document um, and there's a lot of uh, commentary that you know we, we, we add onto it. But I think as he says, if you just read, if an individual takes this PDF and reads it over and over a couple of times, and if you, you know, want to, you're more than welcome to go back and listen to the recordings for added commentary. I think it will provide so much clarity um, to anybody who is embarking on the path about all the necessary things that they should be focused on and all the you know, things that they should be wary of, you know, those pitfalls uh, and dangers, and then heeding the advice, right? And I think for me, when I think of this document, if you go back to um, page 10, the very bottom of it, where he says, I say that being what content with the self, persisting in disobedient acts, and abandoning awareness of Allah are the foundations of all illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls. That to me is what I think of when I think of this document, because that's it. Um, you know, he lays the foundations of the path, but then he also lays the foundations of what is the reason why we suffer as human beings. We suffer because of illness, right? Spiritual and physical tribulations, um, which could be in the world and in the other life, right? And I think it was Ibn Abbas who said, you know, um, with tribulations that we always have to be grateful because A, it could always be worse, right? Um, B, it could be in your uh, dunya and not in your akhira. And the C, it could be in your, in this life and not the, uh, it could be in this life and not the next. And so he's giving us perspective on how to be grateful even when we have tribulations, when we think of these things, right? It could always be worse. And that's true. Our tribulations could always be worse. Um, uh, so, you know, the fact that we have tribulations, which again, could be in dunya and in our deen, um, is something to be very um, mindful of and, and, and fear uh, that we're, we're susceptible to those things when we don't have these things clear, right? For us, we're susceptible to tribulations in our deen. And so, uh, and then the pitfalls, which he outlines beautifully. So he says all of these things that we are, as human beings, wanting to run away from. Nobody wants to suffer through these things. Nobody wants illnesses, spiritual or otherwise. Nobody wants tribulations. Nobody wants to, pitfalls, right? How do we avoid them? Well, he gives us the formula. Don't be content with yourself, right? Don't continue to persist in disobedient acts. And don't forget your Lord. Because if you do those three things you're in trouble. Uh, so the document obviously has much more to offer, but that's just a, a summary. And inshallah, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to next week where we'll, we'll uh, go into uh, the remaining parts of this document. But if there are any questions, we can go ahead and take those questions. I don't know if Sada Fadwa ever joined because she said she would join as soon as she got home, but it's likely just me today. So Alhamdulillah, that's fine. We're still uh, live and I can take questions. So let me see here. I do see a written question. If there's any more, please feel free to type them up. But this one says, would wearing a hijab and being modest apply to adhering to the sunnah? Does that mean our foundation is lacking if we do not wear the hijab? That's a very good question. Jazakallah khairan. Well, you know, we have to be clear here. The hijab is, um, is fard. You know, there's no difference of opinion on that. It is a fard action that is required of uh, a, a Muslim girl and woman once she becomes of age. However, um, if a sister is struggling in that capacity, um, but she has good intentions and she's working towards it, then, um, then she's okay. But if you are not wearing hijab and you have a position about the hijab, that 
is against the normative you know, uh, position, which is that it's far, then that is definitely um, an issue. Yes, that would indicate that there's a, a lack of understanding, a fault, you know, some, something's going on. And so uh, in terms of the practice, I would say anyone who doesn't wear hijab, just constantly be mindful that you need to be in a state of toba, right? That you have to be in a state of toba. So you, you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness um, and recognize that you don't wear hijab um, for whatever reasons, and you might have many reasons why you're not there yet, but you should be open with Allah enough to acknowledge that you're not fulfilling a requirement that he has made for an obligatory upon you. And so that should put you in a state of humility and in a state of, you know, asking Allah for forgiveness, a state of toba, um, and inshallah, and then just keep asking him to guide you to, to it. You know, I met someone actually over the weekend, um, we had a sister's retreat here in the Bay Area, and so a sister came up to me, mashallah, and she said that, you know, this was something um, that m months ago, I think during one of our classes, we talked about a couple of things uh, with regards to wearing the hijab as well as prayer and we were giving counsel and advice and so she said that she um, you know she started to wear the hijab uh, here and there you know uh, which I, I really recommend I really want any sister who does not identify as a hijabi to not fall into the all or none mindset because I feel like that makes it more difficult rather I think anybody who doesn't wear the hijab, you should have the open attitude that I can wear the hijab whenever I want, just like I can pray whenever I want. And if you feel inclined to wear the hijab to the masjid, to certain events, um, to go to the store, you just feel like doing it, do it. But this idea that you have to be a hijabi in order to wear the hijab is just ridiculous. And I don't think that's something we should encourage, you know, that, um, that we put sisters in that very difficult position because the transition has to happen. And sometimes the transition happens with practice. You know, you, you're practicing wearing the hijab every day. You're wearing it here and there. And once you start to do it more and more, what happens is, it becomes infused as part of your personality. I know many people who did that. Uh, one of my very close friends actually did that for years. She did not wear the hijab and everybody presumed, like she did not wear the hijab full time. Um, she wore it, let's say like 80% of the time. Uh, but then there were some situations where she just didn't feel comfortable wearing it around certain family. Um, so she was Many people who met her just presumed that she was a hijabi because she wore it so much more than, uh, and they didn't see her when she didn't wear it. And I think that's a perfectly balanced perspective. Why not? Why do we have to put sisters in this awkward position of they have to commit or no, don't, don't even touch it? Uh, you're, you're a hypocrite. Astaghfirullah, that's horrible. Uh, let her get her practice if she needs a few years of wearing it to certain venues and settings before she's fully comfortable, let her do it. Let her do it without any shaming, without any blaming or putting her on the spot. And then you'll see, because uh, the sister who came up to me, she said, that's what she did. She just started, she took that advice. She started wearing it and she never you know, thought of it before. And then now, alhamdulillah, it's been two months and she's been wearing it full time and her spouse is supportive. Um, I hear these things all the time, alhamdulillah. So I think that's the way we should approach these things. Um, so that's the only question that I see here. Uh, I don't know if there are any more. I'm looking again in the chat. No, I think that was it. And then let me see here on Instagram. And I apologize for those of you on Instagram for the curt, like the slanted thing. Let me actually see if I can take off the charge now. Okay, alhamdulillah. So I don't know if there are any questions, but let me read through here. So, okay, so the sister is asking to, the three things. Okay, sorry, sister, Amina, um, Sidi Ahmed Zuruk in the document says that 
He believes that the reasons why we have illnesses, tribulations, and pitfalls is due to three things, which he said is number one, being too content with the self, right? So that we are, um, we're just, uh, we're comfortable. We're, we don't really see ourselves as being um, that we need development or, or betterment, or we're just resigned to wherever we are and we're satisfied. So self-satisfaction is very dangerous, spiritually speaking. Number one, that's, and then number two is that you're persistently doing haram. Like, you know, that something is forbidden, but you keep doing it. And that is going to be, it's going to lead you to your peril. People who expect um, to be, to receive any type of lasting um, satisfaction or comfort or, um, sorry, I just think it's really, okay. So anybody who, who expects that their life is just going to go well and that they'll have afia, well-being, or, you know, that things will, good things will come to them, but they're directly in disobedience to Allah knowingly, you can see how that's, there's a disconnect there. Why would you expect your life to go well? Which is, for example, one of the things that I always ask sisters who, you know, I, I've met with sisters who come to me and they'll want to take off their hijab. Um, you know, they're wearing hijab and they're starting to struggle with it. And, when, and I'm very direct. Uh, so I'll just start asking a bunch of questions like what's going on. And sometimes, you know, in the past anyway, people have revealed that they're afraid that they, they're not going to get a job or that they're not going to get married if they continue to wear the hijab. And so I try to point out to them how that is such false logic, right? That it's there, it sounds logical but it's actually deception because Iblis comes up with all these ideas that sound like convincing, but if you actually, you know, dissect them a little bit, you realize like how preposterous, preposterous it is, right? To think that disobeying Allah, to, to stop doing an act that is a fard is going to somehow open up the doors of khair upon you. Who do you think is going to bless you with a halal good income who do you think is going to bring to you a righteous good spouse who will take care of you and love you he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-munim he is the source of all good so if you've logically convinced yourself that acting in direct disobedience to him would somehow open up khair for you you can I hope see that that's illogical there's no logic to that um, and it's just a deception of Iblis. So, um, you know, that's the second thing. And then the third thing is that you are not thinking of Allah. You know, if you're, if you can go um, a full day, half a day, a quarter of a day, and Allah is not on your mind or on your tongue, you know, his praise, his remembrance, his dhikr, um, you don't read the Quran, you're not, your prayers are barely there. This is, um, a, a huge danger for you in many ways, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, because we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, away from the evils and the dangers of this world. So what are you going to, who are you, where's your safe haven if it's not Allah? Who is your safe haven? Like, think about it. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to be consistently or as often as possible uh trying to be in his remembrance and if you're not it's really really dangerous um alhamdulillah so uh, i have another question here i'm just looking at both zoom and instagram uh so someone is saying subhanallah i really love the hijab advice because some sisters take it off because of a divorce but they make their daughters wear it or there are lots of arguments about the clothes those teens choose how can one help because the ex-husband's input pushes pressure on uh, the on on children the most, I think. Even if their deeds seem to be the reasons all of them are really struggling with Islam, but even more with the hijab. Um, you know, first of all, we should never make our daughters, our wives, our women, whoever, wear the hijab. It should never come to that. And as soon as you think that that's to strong arm a sister into wearing hijab that you've somehow pat yourself on the back and think you've done good. You're just, it's delusion. 
Laikul Hafidin is very serious. We do not force people to do things because it will, you know, blow back or it will, uh, it won't go well. The, the, anybody who's forced into something may do it for a period of time just because they are pressured and they just don't want to hear it anymore. You know, especially if someone's nagging you or it's held over your head, it's a, it's a power card. Sometimes ultimatums are given and threats are issued. So a person may just give in because it's like enough is enough. I can't deal with it anymore. Fine, I'll do it. Um, but if you're delusional, delusional enough to think that that's somehow a win for you, um, you're prioritizing your own conscience or whatever false idea you have about your responsibility over them, over their spiritual well-being. Because if you're more concerned about their spiritual well-being, then you would take the time to actually explain to them the incredible wisdom of the hijab. And you know, you can do that if you're just analyzing the world, you're looking out into the world, and you can start to connect all the dots with why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put um, you know, the give give uh, both men and women the responsibility of being modest in their dress and for women a little bit more. Let's like let's unpack it, unpack it in a in a way that is informed, that's not emotional, it's not, you know, fueled by uh, personal jealousy, as we say, but it's actually information, which is look at the exploitation of not just women, young girls. You know, I was reading earlier uh, this article about um, this girl who was a, pa she was in pageants and she, um, it was, I don't know where I read it, but anyway, she was in those toddlers and tiara. I don't know if you guys remember that show stuff. Anyway, and she's now a, a high school graduate and she was the valedictorian of her class. And so in the article, she said that someone asked her or the reporter, I think, asked the question, like, what do you say about people who make a claim that, you know, um, pageantry for young girls is sexually exploitative? And, you know, she, of course, because she's in the world of pageantry, she starts to defend it. And she's like, it's, it was, it really helped my confidence and anybody who thinks that it's, they're sick or perverse. So she's made some statement like that. And unfortunately, that's just really being blind to the reality. If you don't think that um, little girls are exploited in this culture, in this time, uh, through these means, right, um, then you're just not awake. You're, you're, it's just you're in your own world because the reality is we have a crisis everybody knows this is real there are groomers there are pedophiles there are sick and twisted demonic forces that target children nowadays we see this topic it's very prevalent unfortunately with uh, people you know consumed with uh indoctrinating children sexualizing children teaching them really disgusting things way too early. Uh, so just look around, see it for what it is. The world has always exploited the vulnerable and amongst those are women and children. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect us. And he literally, the you know some of the translations anyway, say that the reason why we wear the hijab is so that they were known, right? So that we we're, are, we're very clearly manifest that we are Muslim women and to protect us from the molestation of people. And the molestation of people isn't just a physical molestation. It's a visual molestation. So there is incredible wisdom to why our Lord has protected us um, by giving us the obligation of hijab. Um, and if you just start to logically explain these things to young girls, while at the same time being very patient and understanding and empathic and loving and compassionate to know that it takes time for some people to commit, then a sister will eventually see it, inshallah. Especially you're making dua, you're teaching with wisdom, just be patient. Allah will open their heart. But if you think, no, I'm just going to force them and guilt them and shame them until they do it, you will create a horrible situation of hypocrisy likely uh, where a person loses their faith because they they just don't believe in something and then they may never because they were forced ever want to live that life again it's too triggering it's too traumatic 
So that's why we just follow the book of Allah. La ikraha fi din. Um, so may Allah guide them, inshallah. But I think, you know, we have to stop being so emotional. And this is part of, you know, when I teach parents or I do parenting sessions, I really try to emphasize trying to be as logical in our discourse as possible and intellectually inviting our children to conversations instead of using our position as authorities and then becoming emotional and personalizing things. Because if we really want to save their souls, then we have to reach them. We have to reach them. And, and, and that can only come through um, effective communication, inshallah. So, alhamdulillah. All right, I think those were the final questions. I started um, about almost 10 minutes late and we went on for an extra 20 minutes for Q&A. Oh, so the father was gonna be like, what are you doing? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, forgive me, I know. And thank you for everybody who's on the Zoom call because you all are so patient um, waiting uh, through for the session to end. But Alhamdulillah, I think we've finished today's session. We're going to hopefully finish up this document next week, um, inshallah when we come together for our final session. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. I hope you've all enjoyed um, this class so far, uh, but feel free to um, maybe go back to the beginning uh, of the document and, and review again. It's as he says, keep reviewing it until it sticks and it's imprinted on your soul, inshallah. So with that said, um, Jazakumullah khairan again, everyone, on Zoom. Inshallah, we'll see you next week. Um, and those of you on Instagram Live, I know there's a couple more questions. I'll, I'll be back with you in just a second. Um, oh, I think, was there another question? Right at the end, mashallah, in our community, the new thing is to protect the community. Hmm, that's a difficult one. All right, to the sister who came in and slid in at the very end with the final question, I will answer it quickly. She said, in our community, the new thing is to protect their teenage girls, 14 and up, and marry them to older cousins back home. The imams don't say anything and keep talking about modesty, the main focus of spiritual development. What should we do to try to stop this trend? You know, it's um, it's unfortunate, but I think, you know, I, I don't know it's, if, it, if it's something that um, you can necessarily stop uh, um, because especially if it's impacting an, an entire community, uh, something, sometimes these trends take a life of their own and it would be uh, a very tall order to try to stop it. But you can at least, if you hear of people close to you um, who are considering these options, that you advise them and say, you know, um, is there a better, is there another alternative plan? You know, I know that there's fear. There's just a lot of fear right now. Fear of, you know, daughters being taken advantage of and abused, fear of faith being lost. So people are in panic mode and they sometimes uh, jump on these ideas because the other people are doing them. So we have to be very careful. But if it's someone that's close to you and you think that they may not be um, considering an alternative option that you think they should consider, you can always suggest other things. But for the most part, I think um, we should really try to be careful from in meddling too much in other people's lives because you know what if you dissuade someone from doing something that they want to do and you convince them and you think oh I know the right uh, you know I, I have a strong um, feeling about this and you give advice to someone and then things don't work out you'll be at fault they'll come back at you and go it's all your fault I was going to send my daughter I was going to do this but you told me not to so the relationship matters approaching people in this way directly matters and I would just say, if you're asked, always give sound advice the way that you would want uh, to be advised, but don't go out of your way to start to dictate to people and warn people. And now you're, there's a whole um, you know, uh, movement. Uh, just be, be, be wary of that because people are never um, satisfied and they'll always look for a scapegoat. So you might bring unwanted harm to yourself. Anyway. We could talk more about that next week. But Jazakum al everyone, inshallah, take care. Uh, and we'll see you on Monday of next week.
All right, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.